because there's a movie playing, and I know that I don't get a struck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Aloha, and welcome to Middle Earth Storytime. My name is Edwin Boyette. I'm joined by the artist, Elronimus Flash. We will be reading from and illustrating Brian Jake's Red Wall. Let me briefly say hello to the audience, and then we will jump right into the story. I see Arlene. Good to have you here, Arlene. Melissa and Amy Lester. Lady Celtic Moon says, I hope Edwin got his nap in. No nap for me today. I finished up teaching my uh, class today and headed straight here and hopped on. <laughs> But it is good to be here with everyone. I enjoy reading Redwall very much. So it is definitely worth postponing a nap. Alright, if you are reading along at home, we're reading Redwall, the Redwall novel by Brian Jakes. You're going to want to be in the second section, starting with chapter 16. Now, just reminding you from the events of the last few chapters. In the last few chapters, um, Matthias the mouse and Methuselah the mouse have been attempting to locate the sword of Martin the warrior. Now, they kind of deciphered some clues and did an investigation for it. And the sword had been left by Martin hidden in a weather vane. And they come to find out that the sparrows who live on the roof of the abbey probably have stolen the sword of Martin the warrior. And so Matthias, along with one of the sparrows who was injured, Warbeak, are making their way up to the roof of the abbey, to the kingdom of the sparrows. Sorry about that. Looks like I muted myself. Let me double check my volume. Uh, looks like we're still good. Okay, very good. They are making their way up to the, the roof of the abbey to attempt to locate the sword of Martin the Warrior, which they believe will help them defend Redwall Abbey against the forces, the horde, of Clooney the rat. When we left off they had just made their way to the very top and then they were seized by the sparrows. That's where we begin in chapter 16. <clears throat> Dunwing was the widowed mother of Warbeak. She was also sister to the mighty king Bull Spara. When her daughter was shot down by the arrow she had given her up as dead. Now that she was back safe and sound, she stroked and scolded her at the same time, with relief. When she could get a chirp in edgeways, Warbeak related the strange story to her mother in the rapid spar dialect. As she was doing this, Matthias lay pinned to the floor by the claws of many fierce sparrow warriors. As far as he could tell, the place was one enormous loft. This was the court of King Bull Spara, whose wrath seemed about to descend upon him. The sparrows lived higgly piggedly here in one great untidy tribe. The roof above met in the shape of an upturned V thus making the court a lone triangular structure. Under the eaves at either edge were countless scruffy-looking nests, all of which appeared to be filled to overflowing with shrieking baby sparrows. At one end, the loft was blocked off by roofing slates and old nesting materials. This was the king's own private chamber, Matthias estimated that it was probably underneath where the weather vane was situated. King Bullspara was not a bird to be trifled with. 
he noticed the young mouse's evident interest in his surroundings and quickly diverted his attention with a savage kick at the helpless figure. What a mouse! What a mouse worm! Want in court of king, he snapped. Matthias, realizing that this was no time for idle chit-chat, promptly shouted out in a loud courtly manner, O oh, king, I come to return one of your brave young warriors. The statement caused an immediate hullabaloo. Bull Spara flapped his wings once and quiet descended. He cocked his head to one side, assessing this bold young intruder. You lie, mouse worm. Not help, Spara. Mouse enemy, he shrieked. King Bull Spara, say killy enemy. Kill eat. Instantly, Matthias found himself fighting for his life. The Spara soldiers piled in on him, jabbering, clawing, and pecking. He managed to get a paw free and struck out left and right dealing hefty blows to several of the sparrows. Matthias, Matthias realized he would soon be overwhelmed as more sparrows pressed in on him, urged on by the mad exhortations of their king. Kill eat! Kill eat! Make Massa dead! Kill eat! As Matthias battled to free his other paw, he felt himself enveloped by two pairs of wings. Warbeak and Dunwing were attempting to shelter him. The mother sparrow was crying out. No killy, mouse good, save my egg, Spara. The king was not convinced. Mouse enemy, got to make dead. King Bull Spara had no fledglings of his own. Warbeak who was his favorite niece, called out to her uncle, appealing for mercy. No, no, King Boo, not kill a Matthias Mouse. Him save Warbeak. Give Spar a word to Mouse that you no killy. My microphone does not want to co cooperate today. Let me see. Let's get this adjusted so. Alright, let me know if it gets too loud. And let me check one more thing. Alright, we should be working now. Again, let me know if the volume gets too loud. The king sprang in among his warriors, scattering them like chaff. They cowered before him as he shouted out a new edict. Fool worms, stop. King say no killy mouse. We have Sparrow word of my sister's egg chick. The Sparrow warriors backed off. Matthias picked himself up. Luckily, he had not come to much harm. He dusted his habit off. Whew. Thank you once again, Warbeak, my friend. I owe you my life. The king issued orders to two spar warriors. Battle Hawk, Wind Plume, get a bag. Find out what mouse carry. Matthias stood firm as the haversack was pulled from his back. The two warriors could not figure out how to open it. They tore at the material with beak and claw until it gave way. The contents scattered upon the floor. Matthias stood respectfully to one side as the king rummaged through his meager possessions. King Bulspara drank some water from the canteen. He spat it out. No worms! Only mouse food, he commented. Warbeak sighed wistfully. 
She looked longingly on, longingly on, as her uncle found the package of candied chestnuts and ripped it open. Bullspar dubiously sampled one. His face lit up with pleasure. This good food for Spara King, not good for Mouse or Worm. Me keep. He tucked the candied chestnuts under his wing, then picked up the collar and lead and beckoned to Matthias. Mouse Worm, come here. You lucky king, let her live. The young mouse approached the sparrow with trepidation, not wanting to antagonize the moody, dangerous bird. The Spara King buckled the collar tightly about Matthias's neck, scarcely leaving him room to breathe. He attached the lead and laughed aloud. Dutifully, the other sparrows laughed with him. Matthias felt his blood boil. He tried to contain his rising temper. The court of the Spara King was no place to have tantrums. Mentally, he promised himself he would never again use a collar on any living creature. The indignity was unspeakable. Bulspara handed the lead to Warbeak. Turning to his subjects, he chuckled insanely and pointed at Matthias. King Bulspara, spare mouse. How you like him for pet, my niece. Mouse, you obey my sister and her egg chick. Funny, huh? All the sparrows laughed loud and long, vying with each other to show the most merriment. The king was a completely unpredictable tyrant. When he made a joke, it was always funny. Warby gave the lead a tug and whispered to her friend. Matthias, you see Warbeak and Mother not make laugh. Sorry. The young captive winked at his warder. He was beginning to hatch a plan. Don't worry, my friend. At least I'm alive. Warbeak handed the lead to her mother. This Dunwing, she mother... Good Spara, not hurt mouse, see? Dunwing gave the lead a light pull. She gave Matthias a smile and a nod. He decided that he liked Warbeak's mother. The king issued his orders to Warbeak and Dunwing. You keep mouse worm on lead. No wonder, no stray. Give plenty work. Much kick, like this. Bullspar raised a kick at Matthias, who dodged nimbly and started to dance and sing with a silly expression on his face. The king stood with his head cocked to one side, amazed at the performance of the strange mouse. Matthias pranced comically about, improvising a song as he went. Up higher than before! I'm near the roof indeed. The king gave me a color. His sister holds the lead. Round and round he skipped, repeating the verse over and over. Bullspara flapped his wings and laughed hysterically. <laughs> Look, Battlehawk, see, Wimplume. Mouse worm be hurt in head brain. He crazy. <laughs> Obediently, everyone laughed with the mad monarch. After a while, the sparrows drifted off, some to their nest, others to hunt worms. A chosen few went with the king to play Three Feathers, a popular spara gambling game, of which Bull Spara was very fond. Dunwing and her daughter led the dancing mouse off to their nest at the rear of the court under the farthest eaves. Despite its outwardly untidy appearance, 
the nest was neat and cozy on the inside. Warbeak had gathered Matthias's gear together, repackaging it into the torn haversack. She returned it to her mouse friend, eyeing him in an apprehensive manner. Matthias, be sick in head? she inquired. The young mouse lay back gratefully in Dunwing's nest and smiled reassuringly at them both. Not at all. I am as sane as you are. However, if I act as if I'm mad, then maybe your king and his warriors will not regard me as a threat. Perhaps they will leave me alone and forget about me. Dunwing looked up from the meal she was preparing. Her eyes were serious. Matthias Mouse, do right thing, she said. Bullspara, be wicked, bad temper. Sometimes Dunwing think Bullspara mad. Best he thinks you no harm, Mouse. Matthias bowed deferentially to her. Thank you, Dunwing. You are a very brave sparrow. You put yourself in Warbeak in great peril, saving me as you did. Dunwing served them both some food. Thankfully, Matthias noted that she refrained from putting worms and dead insects on his portion. The mother sparrow watched him with soft, intelligent eyes. The mouse was about the same age as her daughter. Matthias saved my warbeak, she said. We have no sparrow warrior to look after us. Or be brave like father was. Now father, he dead. I learned to stand up for us. Till war be grow into great warriors someday. The hours slipped by as the three conversed. Matthias learned much of the Spara customs and way of life. Dunwing, being the king's sister, was of royal blood. Her husband had been killed the previous spring in a battle with some starlings. He had saved the life of the king, whereupon Bulspara had vowed to care for her and her daughter. But he had instantly forgotten his promises, leaving the pair to fend for themselves. Only in moments of urgency would Dunwing remind him of his vow, knowing that Bulspara was a dangerous despot. So normally Dunwing maintained a diplomatic silence in his presence. Sometimes Bulspara would retire to his private chamber. He would remain in there brooding for days, suddenly emerging to fire his warriors with grandiose schemes and wild ideas. No one dared to disobey him even though half an hour later he had forgotten his previous foolhardy notion and wandered off to hunt worms. Later he would return to find that his plans had not been carried out. In a furious squabble of accusation and recrimination, he would demote officers and promote the most unlikely soldiers from the ranks. Next day he had forgotten it all again and was hatching more crazy plans. Matthias was constantly amazed at the mode of life in the Spara court. The sparrows showed no kindness or civility to one another, often fighting savagely among themselves on the slightest pretext. Warriors and even fledglings joined in. The injuries they inflicted upon each other were appalling. The Spara folk knew nothing of the firemaker's art, by day the court was illuminated by sunlight that streamed in through the cracked and broken slates and slanted up through the eaves. All the food was eaten uncooked, worms and small insects providing the main diet. The spara did not discriminate between different species of insects. All came under the general heading of worm. Thus a sparrow might make a meal of a butterfly or a grasshopper and referred to it as worm feed. Worm was also used to denote an enemy or a coward 
or anything alien to the spa. Fresh flowers and tender shoots of vegetation were used to supplement the worm diet. Also berries and whatever fruit a spara could carry in flight. Matthias was grateful for this. He abhorred the idea of eating live worms or dead insects. There was no strict routine of chores ever carried out. Apart from parents feeding fledglings, everything was left undone until tomorrow, which meant it was never done. The evidence of this lay all about the court. Dirt, dust, filth, and general chaos prevailed. Matthias gradually found that he could keep pace with the speedy delivery of spara language. It was relatively simple. Some of the spara chattered with such rapidity that Matthias was sure they could not understand themselves. <laughs> Hey, there is a Mr. Cabe, Caleb uh, Chiacelli. Good to see you here. Gabrielle says, angry burbs. They are angry burbs indeed. <laughs> and yeah, the, uh, the insect diet is probably, uh, it's probably keto, yeah. So if you're looking, if you're looking to get the uh, the six pack, go in keto. You can go on the Spara diet. <laughs> I imagine most people would probably not overfeed if they were eating a diet of grubs, grasshoppers, and worms. Mm -hmm. You can get Spara fit. Later this weekend, I'll be I'll be launching my Spara Fit meal kits, which will be packed full of the most nutritious and freshest grasshoppers, grubs, and worms. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gabrielle says the John the Baptist diet. Yeah, that's the one. Matthias was not sure whether Warbeak knew of his mission to bring back Martin's sword. Certainly Dunwing did not. The young mouse had had a good look around most of the court, but the sword was not to be seen. Matthias reasoned that it must be in the one place he had not explored, the private chamber of the king. He thought long and hard about how he might obtain access to the royal apartment did not want to cause trouble for his friends, nor did he want them to suspect what he had came for. And suspo supposing he did ever regain the sword, the next problem would be how to take it safely back down to the floor of the abbey and his own kind. Matthias figured he had been in his new surroundings for a night and a day. Toward the evening of that day, he was sitting outside the nest, repairing his torn haversack and taking stock of his personal effects. Each time a sparrow passed by, he would grin vacantly and strike up his song. No one bothered to take much heed of him. Warbig flew in from a lone worm hunt. She stood watching Matthias. Me hunt worms, she chirped. Bring dandelions for Matthias. Mouse like eat flowers. Matthias replied in spar language. Or be good hunter. Mouse like flower. Make good worm food. Where be done, wing mother? Or be pointed to the king's chamber. Done, wing, get both spar worm food ready. King have no wife to make food. Matthias acted unconcerned. He pulled at the collar to loosen it. Collar hurt, mouse neck, he grinned. 
Gorbig shrugged sympathetically. King Sayuera, no can take off. Me sorry. Matthias continued sorting through his belongings. He came across an unopened package. What a stroke of luck. It was candied chestnuts. Hastily, he slipped them into the haversack, hiding the nuts from Warbeak. Under normal circumstances, he would gladly have given them to his friend. But this was different. Matthias needed them as bait. They continued gossiping until Dunwing returned. After a decent interval, the young mouse spoke to her. You go to King's room all lot of time. Dunwing nodded. Me only Spara King Bull let into there, she laughed. He lazy Spara, not make own worm food. Matthias shared her laughter. Betchen King not know how to make own worm food, he chuckled. What you think, Dunwing? Matthias find a gift for King? The Spara mother looked up sharply. What mouse mean? Gift. Matthias drew close and whispered conspiratorially. You remember how King Boo liked mouse candy nuts? Me find more. You take me. We give nuts to King. Dunwing looked doubtful. What for a mouse won't give nuts to King? Matthias spread his paws as if stating the obvious. So King let mouse free. I want to go back to mouse home. Matthias held his breath and watched Dunwing. Finally, her face softened. She smiled sympathetically. All right, Matthias. We try. Not do much harm. But remember, not make Bullspara bad temper. He kill he sure. With an inward sigh of relief, Matthias swept up the packet of nuts. Thank you, Spara mother, he said. Mouse not make trouble for you. Nuts make King happy. You see. With Matthias trailing behind her on his lead, Dunwing tapped on the slates which formed King Bull Sparrow's wall. An irate voice came from within. Fly away, Sparrow. King wanna sleep. Dunwing realized they had chosen a bad moment. Nevertheless, she persisted, this time tapping harder. Let in, King Brother. It Dunwing and Crazy Mouseworm. Got a gift for Great King. A sleepy head poked round the door opening. Bullspara blinked owlishly at them and yawned in their faces. Better be portent. Majesty no like to be woked, he grumbled. As they entered the room, Matthias skipped about and sang his ditty. Whipping out the packet, pack he selected a nut and popped it straight into the open beak of the astonished ruler. Mouseworm find, mouseworm find more candy nuts for Big King Spara, Matthias giggled. Fetch here quick. Maybe mouse give King all the nuts. King let a mouse go home free. The king munched and chomped greedily on the sweet nut, eyeing the packet covetously. Ha! Mouseworm, give King all the nuts. Majesty have great things on mind. Me think about, hmm, let a mouse go free home. Matthias capered about. He went down on one knee, offering the nuts. Bull Spara snatched the parcel. Hoggishly, he stuffed far more of the nuts into his beak than it could cope with. Closing his eyes in ecstasy, he gobbled furiously. Pieces of nut falling from his beak littered his breast feathers. Matthias's eyes roved about the chamber, searching. 
It was nothing special as Spara habitations went. A straw paleasi, some butterfly wings stuck to the wall by way of decoration. In one corner there was a huge overstuffed old chair. How it got there would forever remain a mystery. Matthias's attention was held by something that protruded out of the back of the chair. It was an old-fashioned looking object, made from black leather with lots of silver trimming, identical to the belt he was wearing, the scabbard of Martin's sword. Surely the sword must be somewhere close by. Matthias wished that he could see round the back of the chair to confirm his discovery, but he had to bring himself back to the issue at hand. King Bullspar crammed the last candied chestnuts into his beak and chomped with evident enjoyment. Dunwing attempted to press for justice. King eat gift! Now mouse go free! The king held out a grasping claw. More! Mouseworm got more candy nut gift from Majesty. Matthias remained kneeling. He appealed to the gluttonous ruler. Oh, king, mouse have got no more candy nuts. Give all to great Majesty. Now you let mouse go free home, he said hopefully. Bull Spora pecked nut morsels from his feathers his eyes gleaming craftily. Ah, uh, now King gives Spar a word. I say if Mouseworm give more candy nuts, then go free, but must give lot. The King spread his wings wide apart. This many lot. The young mouse bowed his head. But Majesty, me got no more nut. Unexpectedly, Bullspar's mood changed for the worse. He crumpled the empty dock leaf packet and hurled it into Matthias's face. Mouseworm get more. More, you hear. His eyes shone madly as the feathered hackles rose around his neck. King not argue with crazy mouse worm. You get gone now, plenty quick, or me killy. Go now, majesty sleep. Seeing that the king had become dangerous, Dunwing did not hesitate. Roughly she dragged the mouse by the lead from the chamber. Matthias spluttered with uncontrolled rage. Dunwing, how you let a stupid oaf be king of Spara, he choked. The mother sparrow shushed soothingly and dragged Matthias off to the safety of her nest. Warbeak had gone off hunting again. Dunwing sat down and tried to reason with the angry young mouse. Matthias not let King Bull here say him stupid oaf. You be dead worm bait much soon. Matthias opened his mouth to protest. The sparrow silenced him with an upraised wing. All birds know King Bull, mighty fighter. Him save Spara tribe many time from enemy. He's sometime lazy. Sometime bad temper, but not stupid. Bull Spara, sly like fox, only pretend to be stupid, just like Matthias. Dunwing had guessed that Matthias had gone to the king's chamber for other reasons than to gain his freedom. This was a very wise mother bird. He decided to put all of his cards on the table. Dunwing, listen, I want to tell you a story, he said. It is all about the mice who live in the abbey beneath us, 
and of one mouse in particular called Martin the Warrior. The sparrow listened intently as the young mouse unfolded the story of Redwall Abbey and the part that he was playing in its hour of need. When Matthias had finished his tale, Dunwing saw the truth of it in his open face. She drew close and said quietly, Matthias, Dunwing knew. First day you come here, I see belt you wear. It all same as thing behind chair in King's room. But why? Matthias interjected. Again, Dunwing silenced him. Young mouse sit still, she said. Now me tell you story. Many time ago, before my mother was egg, king named Bloodfeather. He still soared from North Point. Sword makes Spara folk proud. Brave fighters, strong egg chicks, much worm food to eat. Sword hang in court of Spara. Blood feather die. Who know how? Bull Spara become king. My husband Greytail tell me this for he die. Bull Spara wear warrior sword. Case be too heavy. Leave case behind in room, back a chair. Carry sword and claw feet. King Bull, he much show off. Dig worm with sword. My husband go longer with him. One day, they hunt in moss flower trees. Giant worm come, one with poison teeth. All the time say, Asmodeus. Like that. Bullspara drop big sword. Bullspara drop big sword. Even he's scared of poison teeth. Giant worm coral coil round sword handle. Bullspara, he order my husband, Greytail, get sword back. Greytail try, but worm bite with poison teeth. He hurt bad but fly back to court with Bullspara. Bullspara say hurt in starling fight. Not true. Greytail tell me all for he die. War big still egg. Not know how father die. War big... <coughs> Matthias watched sympathetically as Dunwing fought back her tears. Gently he patted the witted sparrow. Greytail, be mighty warrior to face poison teeth alone. You glad Warbeak be his egg chick. Dunwin smiled through her tears. Matthias, be good mouse. There followed an embarrassed silence. Matthias spoke half aloud. So it seems my quest has been in vain. But what of the scabbard? Scabbard means sword case? Dunwing inquired. Matthias nodded. Me tell about sword case, Dunwing said bitterly. King Bull Spara, be frightened to tell rest of Spara that he lose sword. Ha! Huh. He not know gray tale tell me, but I watch King. Dunwing know. Bull Spara still pretend sword in case. That way he stay king. If I tell her, he kill a me in Warbeak. This I know. Someday, Warbeak, my egg chick, be queen. She have royal blood. Then Spara folk be better, be happy. Bull Spara rule for now, huh? Lose heart, lose sword. No good crazy bird, Bospara. That night, as he settled down to sleep in Dunwing's nest, Matthias had a good deal to reflect upon. So King Bull had lost the sword to a giant worm with poison teeth. 
Matthias knew the description fitted only one thing. A snake. Poison probably meant it was an adder. He had never seen an adder, nor any other type of snake. At Redwall he had learned of snakes from the talk of others. They spoke of the adder as if it were a reptile that was half legend, half nightmare. It was said that even the Father Abbot himself would flatly refuse to treat a snake, no matter how bad its condition might be. Luckily, there had never been calls to. There had never been reports of an adder in the area of moss flower. And that was why most creatures tend to treat it as a mythical reptile. But wise ones like Constance, the abbot, and old Methuselah assured everyone that the adder was cold, deadly fact. They said that in all the world there was nothing more feared, the strong coils, hypnotic eyes, and poison fangs. Matthias shuddered. It sounded even more fearsome than Clooney the Scourge. How could a mere mouse take the sword from this adder that Dunwing had described, the one that said Asmodeus? Matthias tried to put it from his mind. Gradually, sleep overtook him. You come quick, mouse worm. King want to see you. Rough claws seized Matthias, dragging him from the nest only half awake. It was the two sparrow warriors, Battlehawk and Windplume. They lugged Matthias off without further explanation, tugging cruelly on his lead. The last thing he saw before he was pulled off into the darkness of the court were the pale worried faces of Dunwing and Warbeak. He shouted to reassure them, Don't worry, I'll be all right. Take care of yourselves. Battlehawk hit Matthias in the face with a stiff bony wing. Mouseworm, shut beak or me kill he. Not before I see your king you want. The young mouse retorted. Battlehawk aimed a kick at him, but Windplume deflected it. Leave mouse alone. You killy him, king killy us. Windplume grinned at Matthias. Mouse cheeky, but brave like Spara warrior. King Bull Spara had finished napping. Something was disturbing him about the captive mouse. He had been too busy guzzling candied chestnuts to let it bother him. But now that he was wide awake, it hit him like a ton of bricks. The mouse worm's belt. What had taken Dunwing a single glance to recognize had finally dawned on the king. Matthias's belt was the same as the sword case behind his own chair. A broken piece of mirror reflecting the moonlight was the only illumination in the king's chamber. He dismissed his two warriors to wait outside. The king of the Spara folk sat staring at the young mouse in silence. Matthias stood his ground bravely not knowing what to expect, Bull Spara stood up. He strutted about in front of Matthias, then around behind him. Matthias felt his belt gripped from behind by strong claws. The crazed king whispered close in his ear. Where mouse worm get bout? Matthias swallowed hard. He tried to act casual. Belt? Oh, you mean this belt? Mouse always have belt for many long time. 
Not know where me get. Thump! Matthias hit the floor as the king shoved him fiercely in the back. Mouse lie. King bull not worm fool. Where you get. Tell. Tell. As he shouted madly, the sparrow pulled at the belt. Matthias knew he was facing death with the insane ruler in one of his lunatic rages. He must think fast. No got more candy nuts, the young mouse cried. Please, Majesty, give mouse word. No more candy nuts. Me give great king this belt. Then he let a mouse go free home. Matthias's flea had the desired effect upon the mad king. He sat in the big chair, his eyes glinting cunningly. The sparrow law said king must kill a mouse worm. But me, good majesty, no kill a mouse. Give belt to king. Matthias unbuckled the belt and handed it over. King Bull fondled it, then fastened it upon himself. As he admired the belt, strutting in front of the broken mirror, the sparrow spoke in a normal voice. Nice, good belt, mouse no of great sword. Instantly Matthias was on his guard. One wrong word might spell death for Dunwing and Morbeek. He must affect ignorance to allay the king's suspicion. Oh, majesty, that good belt. May king look fine, like mighty warrior. Not look so good on mouse. Bullspara appeared flattered. He preened himself, then asked the question again, this time in a coaxing voice. Surely, Matthias know of great sword. In spite of his dangerous predicament, Matthias was inwardly amused at the king's use of his name. Slumping to the floor, he sat with his head between his paws, the picture of dejected innocence. Oh, mighty king, mouse not have more candy nuts? Eh, not know about sword thing, not even have belt now. Me die if not soon go free. Please let a poor mouse worm go home. Matthias's show of pathos seemed to cheer the king. He tucked his wingtips into the belt that he had fooled the mouse worm into giving him. Ha! He had eaten all the mouse's nuts, too. Feeling no end of a fine bird, he gave a sharp whistle that brought his two warriors on the double. Look at this mouse worm, he scoffed. He not happy that I spare him. You take Mouse back to my sister Dunwing. Tell her King say, take care of Mouse Worm. He give me good gifts, candy nut, belt. Maybe Mouse find more gift for good majesty who let live. Take way now, must get more sleep. Go. As Matthias was dragged off once more, he pretended to cry out in distress. This caused King Bullspara much amusement. He waved a wing in farewell, calling out to the prisoner, Ha <laughs> ha! Get a good sleep, Mouse Worm. Think a way to get more gift from Majesty. Ha 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 ha! The two warriors in a nearby fledgling who were half awake laughed obediently with their king. Matthias thanked his lucky stars that he had once more come out alive. Had he refused to give the belt, he surely would have died. 
Anyhow, he reflected, it was only a temporary loan, as he planned on stealing the scabbard from Bullspara. Why not the belt to go with it? Thus ends 16. Uh, let me see how many pages we have in 17. A little bit more than we want to start today. And there's some there's some cool scenes in there. So Flash may want to draw something from that. Let me catch up with the with the chat. Oh wow. Look at that King Sparrow. <laughs> it is looking good. It is a majestic Sparrow warrior. Alright. Alright, there's Vic. Hey Vic, good to see you. Jeff Potts made it. Sneaky stabby snake. Amy Lester says, so as Modius has the sword now, that would be funny to see him try to use it. About as easy to do as a sparrow putting on a belt. Yeah. Hmm. Vic says, is that Edwin the Beak? No, I think my part, I'm Captain Snow the Owl. <laughs> a similar beaked creature. We'll meet him in a couple of chapters. Yeah. And I would say, Flash, this drawing is five times as good as a finger painting by Asmodeus the Snake. <laughs> Gabrielle says, King Sparrow is... He looks like a bull sparrow, doesn't he? Alright, do you still have, um, do you still have background noise flash? Is there still a movie playing in your background? I think that was the wave of yes. <laughs> flash is pantomiming something about Asmodeus. Very good. Asmodeus, the hypnotic. That's where the hypnosis comes from. <laughs> All right. Yes. Flash is explaining through the medium of interpretive hand dance. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this about Flash, but he is. He actually went to Juilliard School for the Arts for uh, hand dancing. Spent uh, five years studying under the master hand dancing teacher. Uh, it's something that a lot of people don't know. <laughs> hand dancing is of course, you know, in the in the realm of jazz fingers. Uh, jazz fingers is obviously a diluted diluted form of the hand dancing that's studied at Juilliard. Uh, all right, before we say goodbye, let's do just a couple more pages from my side of the mountain. Does everybody have time for about 10 minutes of my side of the mountain before we say goodnight? That was some of the book that we started reading last night. Oh, at my side of the mountain, I'll back up just about a page here. 
Well, that almost made me cry. My bait was gone. My hook was broken. And I was getting cold, frightened, and mad. I whittled another hook, but this time I cheated and used string to wind it together instead of bark. I walked back to the log and luckily found another grub. I hurried to the pool and I flipped a trout out of the water before I knew I had a bite. The fish flopped and I threw my whole body over it. I could not bear to think of it flopping itself back into the stream. I cleaned it like I had seen the man at the fish market do, examined its stomach and found it empty. This horrified me. What I didn't know was that an empty stomach means the fish are hungry and will eat just about anything. However, I thought at the time that I was a goner. Sadly, I put some of the internal organs on my hook, and before I could get my line to the bottom, I had another bite. I lost that one, but got the next one. I stopped when I had five nice little trout and looked around for a place to build a camp and make a fire. It wasn't hard to find a pretty spot along that stream. I selected a place beside a mossy rock in a circle of hemlocks. I decided to make a bed before I cooked. I cut off some boughs for a mattress and I leaned some dead limbs against the boulder and covered them with hemlock limbs. This made a kind of tent. I crawled in, lay down, and felt alone and secret and very excited. But ah, the rest of the story. I was on the northeast side of the mountain. It grew dark and cold early. Seeing the shadows slide down on me, I frantically ran around gathering firewood. This is about the only thing I did right from that moment until dawn, because I remembered that the driest wood in a forest is the dead limbs that are still on the trees, and I gathered an enormous pile of them. That pile must still be there, for I never got a fire going. I got sparks, sparks, and sparks. I even hit the tinder with the sparks. The tinder burned all right, but that was as far as I got. I blew on it. I breathed on it. I cupped it in my hands. But no sooner did I add twigs than the whole thing went black. Then it got too dark to see. I clicked steel and flint together, even though I couldn't see the tinder. Finally, I gave up and crawled into my hemlock tent, hungry, cold, miserable. I can talk about that first night now, although it is still embarrassing to me because I was so stupid and scared. I hate to admit it. I had made my hemlock bed right in the stream valley where the wind drained down from the cold mountain top. It might have been all right if I had made it on the other side of the boulder, but I didn't. I was right on the main highway of the cold winds as they tore down upon the valley below. I didn't have enough hemlock boughs underneath me, and before I had my head down, my, com my stomach was cold and damp. I took some boughs off the roof and stuffed them under me. Then my shoulders were cold. I curled up in a ball and was almost asleep when a whippoorwill called me. If you have ever been within 40 feet of a whippoorwill, you will understand why I couldn't even shut my eyes. You're deafening. Well, anyway, the whole night went on like that. I don't think I slept 15 minutes, and I was so scared and tired, and my throat was dry. I wanted a drink, but didn't dare near go near the stream for fear of making a misstep and falling in and getting wet. So I sat tight and shivered and shook. 
and now I'm able to see. I cried a little tiny bit. Fortunately, the sun has a wonderfully glorious habit of rising every morning. When the sky lightened, when the birds awoke, I knew I would never see anything so splendid as the round red sun coming up over the earth. I was immediately cheered and set out directly for the highway. Somehow, I thought, if I was a little nearer the road, everything would be all right. I climbed a hill and stopped. There was a house. A house, warm and cozy, with smoke coming out the chimney and lights in the windows. And only a hundred feet away from my torture camp, Without considering my pride, I ran down the hill and banged on the door. A nice old man answered. I told him everything in one long sentence and then said, And so, can I cook my fish here? Because I haven't eaten in years. He chuckled, stroked his whiskery face, and took the fish. He had them cooking in a pan before I knew what his name was. Uh, when I asked him, he said Bill something, but I never heard his last name because I fell asleep in his rocking chair and was pulled up beside the big, hot, glorious wood stove in the kitchen. I ate the fish some hours later, also some bread, jelly, oatmeal, and cream. And then he said to me, Sam Gribbley, if you're going to run off and live in the woods, you'd better learn how to make a fire. Come with me. We spent the afternoon practicing. I penciled these notes on the back of a scrap of paper so I wouldn't forget. When the tender glows, keep blowing and add fine dry needles one by one and keep blowing steadily lightly and evenly. Add one inch of dry twigs to the needles and then give her a good big handful of small dry stuff. Keep blowing. The next chapter is entitled The Manner in Which I Find Gripley's Farm. The next day I told Bill goodbye and as I strode, warm and fed, onto the road. He called to me. I'll see you tonight. The back door will be open if you want a roof over your head. I said, okay. But I knew I wouldn't see Bill again. I knew how to make fire, and that was my weapon. With fire, I could conquer the cat skills. I also knew how to fish. To fish? And to make a fire? That was all I needed to know, I thought. Three rides that morning took me to Delhi. Somewhere around here was Great Grandfather's Beech Tree, with the name Gribbly carved on it. That much I knew from Dad's story. By six o'clock, I still had not found anyone who had even heard of the Gribblies, much less Gribbly's Beach and so I slept on the porch of a schoolhouse and ate chocolate bars for supper. It was cold and hard, but I was so tired I could have slept in a wind tunnel. Vic, the Catskill Mountains. Well, this book is called My Side of the Mountain and the Catskills. It's a, uh, it's a mountain range in New York State, uh, southern eastern New York State. And this area has the Catskill Forest Preserve, uh, a couple of different mountains, individual mountains within the mountain range. So it's sort of a, a moderately wild area of New York State.
By six o'clock, I had still not found anyone who had even heard of the Gribblies, much less Gribblies Beach. And so I slept on the porch of a schoolhouse, and I ate chocolate bars for supper. It was cold and hard, but I was so tired I could have slept in a wind tunnel. I don't, I thought, real hard. Where would I find out about the Gribbly farm? Some old map, I said. Where would I find an old map? The library? Maybe. I tried and see. The librarian was very helpful. She was sort of young, had brown hair and brown eyes, and loved books as much as I did. The library didn't open until 10.30. I got there at 9. After I had lolled and rolled and sat on the steps for 15 or 20 minutes, the door whisk opened, and this tall lady asked me to come on in and browse around to opening time. All I said to her was that I wanted to find the old Gribbly for him, and that the Gribblies hadn't lived on it for maybe a hundred years, and she was off. I can still hear her heels click when I think of her, scattering herself around those shelves, finding me old maps, histories of the Catskills, and files of letters and deeds that must have come from attics around Delhi. Miss Turner, that was her name. She found Gribbley's farm in an old book of Delaware County, and she worked out the roads to it and drew me maps and everything. Finally, she said, What do you want to know for? Is this some school project? Oh no, Miss Turner. Oh no, Miss Turner. I want to go live there. But Sam, it's all forest and trees now. The house is probably only a foundation covered with, m with moss. That's just what I want. I'm going to trap animals and eat nuts and bulbs and berries and make myself a house. You see, I'm Sam Gribbley, and I thought I would like to live on my great-grandfather's farm. Miss Turner was the only person who believed me. She smiled, sat back in her chair, and said, Well, I declare. The library was opening when I gathered the notes we had made and started off. As I pushed open the door, Miss Turner leaned over and said to me, Sam, we have some very good books on plants and trees and animals, in case you get stuck. I knew what she was thinking, so I told her I would remember that. And with Miss Turner's map, I found the first stone wall that marked the farm. The old roads to it were all grown up and mostly gone, but by locating the stream at the bottom of the mountain, I was able to begin at the bridge and go north and up a mile and a half. There, canterpilling around boulders, roller coastering up ravines and down hills, was the mound of rocks that had once been great grandfather's boundary fence. And then, do you know, I couldn't believe it. I was there. I sat up on the old gray stones a long time looking through the forest, up that steep mountain, and saying to myself, It must be Sunday afternoon, and it's raining, and Dad is trying to keep us all quiet by telling us about Great Grandfather's farm, and he's telling it, it's so real that I can see it. And then I said, No, I'm here, because I was never this hungry before. All right, let me mark the place here. I mark the place here, and then we can we can revisit this sometime in the future. My side of the mountain. Oh, I didn't even notice that Flash had had gone out. <laughs> I had my face buried. Oh no. <laughs> I wonder if he lost internet. Maybe he lost internet. Oh no. Oh, 
All right, we will we will leave it here. We will leave it here. Flash has poofed away. Yeah, he's probably having some internet problems. We will say good night here, and we will have a story time tomorrow uh, at about the same time. So we hope to see you tomorrow evening. And until we meet again, may God bless you and your families. Aloha. Good night.